Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we will be talking about the case that shook Singapore to its core. But before we do that, let's rewind and go back to September 26, 1996, when a little girl named Huang Na was born in Fujian, China to her parents Huang Qingrong and Huang Xuying. Qingrong and Xuying both belonged to farming families in Fujian, China and had quite some difficulty trying to make both ends meet for the family. So that's why just a few months after Huang Na was born, Ching Rong made the difficult decision to leave his little family behind. He left the mainland in hopes of making more money for his family, and then settled in Singapore where he worked illegally as a vegetable packer in Pasir Panjang Wholesale Center. Now, Ching Rong did make more money in Singapore compared to when he was back in China. However, this did not make things easier for the family because Shuying discovered that her husband had been lying to her. Shuying found out about the multiple affairs that Ching Rong was having with multiple women in Singapore. This resulted to Shuying filing for divorce and gaining full custody of their infant daughter, Huang Na. Now, a few years after this, Xu Ying met and married a businessman named Zhang Wanhai, and they welcomed their first child in early 2003. In May of the same year, Xu Ying flew to Singapore as a Peidu Mama to accompany Huang Na, who is now enrolled in Jintai Primary School. Peidu Mamas are study mamas, and they are foreign women who accompany their children who are receiving primary or secondary education in Singapore. And most of these study mamas or peidu mamas are from the mainland or from China. Now, just like what Ching Rong did a few years back, Shuying also worked as a vegetable packer in the Pasir Panjang Wholesale Center. She and Huang Na lived near the area with four other flatmates in a very small flat. In late September of 2004, Xu Ying traveled back to China to visit her husband and her other daughter, leaving Huang Na in the care of their four flatmates. Xu Ying was scheduled to return to Singapore on the evening October 10th. However, Huang Na really missed her mother and longed to hear her voice. Huang Na then asked one of their flatmates if she could go to a nearby phone booth to call her mother. Now, this phone booth was located in the food court of the wholesale center and was only approximately 500 meters away from their flat. So, the flatmate agreed, telling Huang Na to come back immediately. At around 1 p.m., Huang Na called her mother, reminding her of two gifts that she promised, a computerized English dictionary, which was a huge thing for Asians back in the early 2000s, and a pair of sandals. Xu Ying then informed Huang Na that instead of coming back to Singapore that evening, she will be coming back the day after instead, so October 11th. Now, 3.30 rolls around, and Huang Na isn't back in their flat yet. And since it had already been two and a half hours since she initially left, their flatmate grew quite worried. So this flatmate decided to head to the food court in Pasir Panjang Wholesale Center and tried to look for Huang Na. However, she did not see any sign of the child. Now, growing even more concerned, or more worried about this situation, the flatmate then decided to walk the short distance to Jintai Elementary School, where Huang Na was enrolled. And again, she did not find Huang Na there. Now, this is where the panic started to settle in. The flatmate then rushed home, talking to her three other flatmates, asking them for help. So the four flatmates scoured the entire Pasir Panjang Wholesale Center, asking everyone they could if they had seen the child. Until at around 9 p.m. when they bumped into a 22-year-old vegetable packer named Tuk Leng Hao, who was also Shuying's co-worker and a close friend of Huang Na. 
According to the Malaysian born Tuk, he saw Huang Na around the food court at around 1 p.m. when he was there purchasing mangoes. She was reportedly wearing a denim jacket, shorts, and was oddly walking around barefoot. Four flatmates looked around for an hour more before finally deciding to call the police at around 10 p.m. to officially report Huang Na as missing. An investigation and search operation began immediately. Shuying also rushed back to Singapore to help with the search. For days, she'd walk around in different nearby areas showing passers-by photos of her missing child. She searched everywhere, including the mountains, but did not find anything, not even a clue. Now, a barista from a cafe also came forward saying that he'd also seen Huang Na around the food court at approximately 1 p.m. that day. However, this would sadly be their last lead and no further sightings of the child were ever reported. The news of this case spread like wildfire across Singapore and help soon started to flood in. Reward money was donated. A website dedicated to finding Huang Na was created. Posters and flyers with the photos of this child was plastered all over and numerous taxi drivers were even dispatched to try and search for her. This case took the whole nation by storm, resulting to a widespread panic, especially for parents who are now concerned for their own children's well-being and safety. Police wasted no time and started the investigation right away, quickly learning that the last person who had ever seen the missing girl was the 22-year-old vegetable packer Tuk Leng Hao. The same guy that the flatmates talked to on the night of the child's disappearance. Turns out that despite being a married 22-year-old father, Tuk was kind of childish and had a below-average IQ. He was also said to be very fond of Wang Na and would often play with her around the area. Police investigators initially spoke to him on the 19th of October, nine days after Huang Na went missing. According to Tuk, he saw Huang Na near the phone booth at around 1 p.m. and told her to go home to her flat. However, he was questioned again the next day and this is where his story changed for the first time. Tuk now claims that he witnessed Huang Na being forcefully taken by a group of people who wanted to teach Shuying a lesson. According to him, he knew who these people were and even offered to help the police negotiate with them. However, he needed to go home first because the numbers of these people were saved in a backup phone. The next day, Tuk was escorted by the police to his home and his workplace to retrieve two cell phones. Once they got back to the police station, he even offered to take a lie detector test, which the police of course agreed to. Now, they were already on their way to the CID headquarters to take this lie detector test when Tuk asks the police if they could grab a bite as he was getting hungry. Now, at this point in the case, Tuk was not a suspect. In fact, he was a very helpful witness. So the police agreed. They, they stopped by at a restaurant where they all sat down at a table and Tuk ordered some curry. My personal favorite. And then after ordering, he excused himself to go to the bathroom. However, instead of going to the bathroom, Tuk exited and escaped through the back door of this restaurant. Fishy. And since Tuk was initially coming in for a lie detector test, he was given a visitor's pass with the CID emblem on it. He wore this emblem in hopes of passing as a police officer and he succeeded. It really worked. In no time, he was crossing the customs checkpoints to the border on his way back to his hometown in Malaysia.
At first, there wasn't really enough evidence to say that Tut had anything to do with Huangna's disappearance. However, his sudden escape did raise a lot of suspicion, immediately making him the prime suspect. This began a nationwide manhunt, and everyone kept their eye out for Tuk. This case made so much headlines that the manhunt eventually reached Malaysia, where Tuk was later located and arrested just a week after his escape. He surrendered himself to the local authorities in Penang, Malaysia, who then sent him back to the custody of Singaporean police that very same day. Tuk was interrogated right away, and this is where his story changes yet again, saying that he and Huang Na were playing hide-and-seek when she suddenly collapsed to the ground and started convulsing. But what's weird is that he also stated that their version of hide-and-seek was a little different as it required the little girl to have her feet and hands bound. According to Tuk, Huang Na always managed to untie herself. However, something went terribly wrong that day. According to his version of events, the lights in his workplace were turned off and as he was calling out trying to find the little girl, he suddenly hears a loud thump, making him turn on the lights. And that's when he saw her sprawled out on the ground with blood trickling on the side of her mouth. The eight-year-old then started to have a seizure urinating all over the floor before all of a sudden, she stops moving. Now, in an attempt to end her suffering, Tuk Leng Hao chucked Huang Na on the back of the neck thrice. He also said that he took both of his hands and placed it on the girl's neck, momentarily pressing on it. Huangna then started to hiccup, making Tuk panic. Not knowing what to do, he proceeded to stomp on her head and body before undressing the eight-year-old girl and violating her. He said that he did this on purpose to make it look like a rape slay case instead of an accident that happened while she was playing with him and because he did not want things to get blamed on him. Now, after he was done doing the unthinkable, he then proceeded to wrap her body up in nine layers of plastic bags before stuffing it into a cardboard box and loading it on the back of his motorcycle. He then made his way to Telok Blanga Hill Park, where he disposed of the box, saying that he threw it over a heavily wooded area of the park. On October 23rd, nearly two weeks after the eight-year-old Huang Na who had first gone missing, the authorities headed to that park, to that wooded area, to look for her remains, and after just half an hour, they found the box. The police were very careful and ultimately decided to keep the box sealed as they did not want to contaminate any possible evidence inside of it. It was brought to a nearby hospital for identification and an autopsy. Now, the mother, Xu Ying, was asked to identify her daughter and she was able to do so because she recognized Huang Na's teeth. And this was later confirmed via dental records and forensic testing. And since Huang Na's body was meticulously wrapped in nine layers of plastic and tape, her remains were quite well preserved and all of the forensic evidence that came along with it. Now, the autopsy revealed that eight-year-old Huang Na did consume mangoes just a little while before she met her untimely demise. And remember, I told you, when Tuk Leng Hao saw Huang Na at the Pasir Panjang Wholesale Center on the day of her disappearance, he was at the food court buying mangoes. It also revealed that her actual cause of death was smothering and that she had multiple injuries. She had injuries on her face and on her scalp suggesting that she had been stomped on. She also had injuries on her arm and leg. Now, although there was no physical evidence of a sexual assault, Tuk Leng Hao did confess to violating the child in his previous interrogation. 
all of the findings in the autopsy did not match to Kling Hao's version of events aside from the stomping. On the 11th of June, 2005, the trial against Tuk Ling Hao began. Now, the defense argued that Tuk showed symptoms of schizophrenia, but this attempt at an insanity plea failed. On the 26th of August, 2005, Tuk Ling Hao was found guilty of the murder of 8-year-old Huang Na. Now, here's the suggested version of events or the suggested timeline according to police. Um, according to the investigators, they think that Huang Na was lured in by Tuk using these mangoes. He then tied her up, and proceeded to violate her. And scared that the child would tell on him, he decided to stomp on her and smother her. They said that it's also possible that he didn't really kill the child by stomping on her and pressing on her neck. Since her cause of death was smothering, it's possible that she died when she was stuffed inside the box. Now, as I've mentioned, on August 26, 2005, Tuk was found guilty and was imprisoned. Tuk Ling Hao was sentenced to death but tried to appeal this and plea for clemency. But of course, due to the severity of his crimes, all of his pleas were rejected by the court. On the 3rd of November 2006, Tuk Ling Hao was executed by hanging, leaving behind his wife and a toddler. And this is the last photo of, or at least the last known photo that he took when he was still alive. And this was taken in prison before his execution and was personally chosen by him to be used for his obituary. So it has been 18 years since this tragic event. Huang Na would have been 26 years old this year. And I hope that her family found peace. It's just so sad because they actually went to Singapore in hopes of a better future for Huang Na. And that's why a lot of people from the mainland, especially in the early 2000s, a lot of them decided to move to Singapore for their children to receive primary and secondary education in Singapore because Singaporean education is really high quality. And she only lived to be 8 years old. She was clearly a joy to everyone around her. She did not deserve everything that happened to her so i know this case was again heavy just like last week's case i'm going to try to find a case for next week that isn't so heavy and i guess that's pretty much it for today's true crime tuesday video thank you so much for watching i'll see you all on friday for a makeup review thank you so much for watching i'll see you all on my next video